today. Our professional development norms are familiar. Please, well, thank you for being here. And that shows that you are committed and that you're responsible for your learning. So just be respectful. And since we're a small group, be respectful and take care of your, if you have any questions, jump right on in and be safe. Uh, for virtual learning, it's nice if you would please put your microphone on mute, but if you would show your camera yourself on your camera, if you don't mind, because we will ask for um, like a visual, a nod or a thumbs up, just in case you have any questions and you want to jump in, feel free to just jump in since we're so small. All right, we always like to start with what we're learning and how it relates to the framework and well, I don't know why I jumped ahead, but we always come back to the framework and four letters. What we feel confident in is that that blue is kind of like what we're teaching and how we're teaching it. And letters really applies to all of that. We're teaching the foundational standards of reading. And with letters, we're learning the best practice ways to do that. The other thing about letters is it really also works and speaks to the red, the data. Uh, we're always looking at our data and hoping to improve our data. So as we're getting near to a cadence, that'd be a great time to look at our data and see how letters is doing with that. And then that yellow, the teaming structures and problem solving is really what we want you to do with letters so that you are implementing it and using the knowledge to the best of your abilities. All right, I just want to make sure I'm not cutting off my slides. So our learning intentions today are to learn how to successfully complete the Unit 3 worksheets and submit them in Canvas. We really want to make sure you're successful. So we're going to go kind of quickly through each of the session worksheets and give you just some tips or tricks for how to complete them as easily as possible. And you'll know you are successful when all your assignments are successfully completed and submitted. And we're going to talk about what a successful assignment would look like as we get through each worksheet. Can I add on there, Les, just yep. for a sec? Yep. I think an important thing to keep in mind with all of this is that the success criteria really is twofold. Um, it is the teacher being successful in mastering the material and the understanding and the knowledge and the background knowledge for bringing, kind of enhancing your tool box, if you will. But it's also, teachers already know how to read. So it's all about working with your students and improving their student outcomes. Thank you for that. All right, our agenda is simple. We're just going to go through each of the eight worksheets after we've reviewed why the bridge to practice is so important. Right. Just kind of a reminder of why the bridge to practice. We know from studies about how to uh, improve practice that sitting gets don't work, that seeing it works a little bit better, that some feedback helps a little bit more. But if we really want the learning to stick, coaching is the best way to make it happen. And so the bridge to practice takes that into account by working with coaches to do the observations and to do the implementation. Uh, because as Einstein points out, if you never made a mistake, you never tried anything new. <laughs> and so we really do want to highlight, we know that letters is a lot of new stuff and sometimes there'll be mistakes and that's okay. That's why we're here is to learn and model learning with our students. Why three case study students? The biggest reason that the, that the letters program itself and Canyons want you to look at three different students is because each student is unique. If we just looked at one student, we might not see the variations in student mastery and student learning. And we really want, as we go through this process, to look at how each student is unique. Much like a doctor when they look at their patients, even if patients have the same disease or, I don't know, virus, <laughs> each person might have it a little bit differently and their treatment might be a little bit different. And so that's why we want you to look at three students so that we can see their different strengths and weaknesses to see how they learn differently and see how they need instruction that caters to those strengths, not just give everybody the same dose, even if they don't have all the same symptoms. And that helps us be attentive to the unique challenges of each student and know how to attend to each needs 
and be able to rely on the routines based in the science of reading to meet those kids' needs. Like we hope our doctors would give us each individual <laughs> prescriptions, not just you all are sick, so you all get an aspirin. So that's kind of why we're doing the three case study students. Now my friend Lee is going to talk about our first assignment. Ooh, the first assignment. <laughs> Before we go on, Susan, do you have any questions? Since you're a complete audience right now. <laughs> okay. All right. So for the uh, unit session one assignment, it is a discussion. So per usual, you will be asked to respond to the prompt and then respond to two of your colleagues to get ideas. And I, I can't even tell you how impressed we have been with your responses in the discussions. They are thoughtful, they are complete, they consider individual students, they, they're, they're just, they're sensitive and kind and complimentary of the students and, and they really show how keen you are on knowing your students so well. So kudos on the discussions we've seen so far. In this discussion, you're gonna be talking about what routines you do currently what you what which ones you use with your students whether it's whole group small group skill based time and what tools you use with those if you're using manipulatives if you're using flashcards or chips or screens or whatever it is and then also if it's appropriate to discuss how you manage those manipulatives because once you add that level of complexity you open the door to a whole bunch of shenanigans and we're trying to stay away from shenanigans. So uh, that is something to, to discuss and to add into your discussion. And then the second point is, what areas do you want to improve? So what do you want to try? What do you want to enhance? What do you want to do better? What do you notice your kids are still needing after your instruction? And think about your, your routines, your activities. And if you want to try new ones, we do not expect teachers to be perfect ever. So by trying something new, the idea is try it, see if it works. You might finish a lesson and after 10 minutes go, never mind, this is a nightmare. I'm so sorry, children. Well, I'll revamp this and we'll do it again tomorrow or tomorrow we'll try something different. So take out your decodable books and let's go. <laughs> it, it, it's you just it's a trial and error thing. And like like Leslie said about Albert Einstein, if you never tried anything new, we all know about that now. So give it a shot. Take a risk. Nobody's going to be judging you. It's all about your learning. The last the second part of the discussion is to respond to to colleagues. So we'd really encourage you there to kind of skim through and see what other people are doing. When we do live professional development, we like to give you a lot of time to talk to your peers because we know you learn a lot from them and what works in their classroom. We really can't do that. So we'd encourage you in the discussion to skim through what other people are doing and see if something strikes you as something you'd like to try. And maybe those are the two people that you respond to. Uh, in the discussion. Do you have any questions about that, Susan? Okay. No, I feel pretty confident about that one. Excellent. Awesome. So the next one is session two, consider one student at a time and reflect on their individual challenges related to spelling. So this is all about spelling and it is um, kids make individual, <gasps> I have to tell you, sorry <laughs> to interrupt myself, my CTAS goal in my reflection from the first part of the year is that I said um a lot. So I'm trying not to say um and I just <laughs> said um. So I'm really sorry about that and I will try and do better here on in. So back to session two, uh, students misspelling words. So you are going to be looking at spelling errors. Are they orthographic or due to other confusions? What can you teach the student to, to improve their spelling? What do they need to know that they don't know yet? They haven't mastered yet. They haven't practiced enough yet. And how will you teach that? 
because simple things like a word never ends in V alone, that's a perfect example of something that I didn't know that until my postgraduate work when I was working for a nonprofit organization doing Orton Gillingham. I didn't know the rule, but if we can simply state the rule, then that will let them know they have to put an E at the end of that word to give the vowel its power to be long. In a word like gave, if they misspell it, G-A-V, they need that a rule, a word never ends in V alone rule. So that would be an example. So those are the kinds of things that we're looking for on the worksheet. And again, too, you could just use for this assignment, your weekly spelling test. You could use your kids responses in the dictation routine. You don't have to necessarily give a different, for this worksheet, give a different spelling assessment. And I wanted to point that out because for session three, you do give another <laughs> assessment. So for this one, this is based on what you've noticed already in what you normally do in the week. What spelling errors do you see? Susan, do you have any questions about that? I did, but it kind of just went off my, I like the part about the rules. Mm -hmm. I, I Going to school, I didn't learn the rules. We just, it was just rote memory. And so having to go back and learn all the rules, I think is a goal that I need to have going mm -hmm. into this letters program because I, I didn't learn that way. Right. Like you said, it's our, it's the teaching, what we learned and what we need to learn now to help them improve on our teaching and on our knowledge. So Perfect. Look, I didn't learn most of these spelling rules until okay. I did the letters program. So okay. there is there a place in the letters program that has the uh, most of the rules or is that? Uh, Unit four does have quite a few of okay. them. Uh, it has a lot. Mm -hmm. Unit three mm -hmm. gets into it and then so does unit four. Okay. Awesome. Okay, good. Okay, so unit or session two was asking you to just look at work you're already having your kids do to notice spelling errors. And session three is asking you to get a little bit more um, specific. So session three does ask you for your three students to administer one of the decoding and word reading uh, surveys. So for our younger grades, you'll probably do the beginning decoding. Upper grades will probably do the advanced, depending on your kids. You might be a third grade teacher whose kids are so low that you want to do the beginning. So just consider your kids and which of the two uh, screeners you want to use. But you're going to administer the screener, and it's linked in the assignment. And it takes about five minutes per kid. Uh, so you'll administer it to your three kids. And then what we would like you to do is upload each of those three assessments, but then do the reflection for just one student. So we want you to get the practice of noticing the patterns for the kid. And so we're asking you to fill out for one student the reflection, but to give the assessment to each. And again, we just want you to notice what types of errors they're making, uh, where they're at and what comes next. The instructions are included with the assessment, but for both of them, you're going to uh, stop administering when your kids are failing more than they're succeeding. So it says it takes five to 10 minutes, but I think for most of our low kids, you won't hit that 10 minute mark because they're low kids. So you won't do the whole assessment. Okay. And then session four introduces letters and phonemes and starts to do that phonics, that uh, phonemic part, the phoneme grapheme awareness and how are you instructing your kids in that? So for session four, you're going to pick an activity that's in the session. It gives you a number of options to choose from and introduce an activity to them. And you can do it whole group with your all of your kids if you think all of your kids would benefit from it. Or you can do it small group with your uh, case study students if you think that it's lower than your whole class. And then you're just going to talk about what activity did you do and what worked and what would you do differently next time. And we're only asking you to fill one out, but in filling out the one sheet, it might work under what worked well. You might think about wh what worked for each kid. Like this part of the activity worked with student one, uh, student two didn't respond as well. 
might be something that you notice and what worked or what would you do differently would be those individual student differences. And to add on to that real quick, another consideration, if you notice that student one mastered it and they can move on, but student two did not, that's gonna influence how you plan forward for that student. So even though they're in the same group, they may not be doing all the same thing or receiving the same instruction and attention from you. Okay. Awesome. All right. So for session five, the idea is to consider your case study students. I know that's a radical new thought for you, but consider what, <laughs> if any changes you could make to meet your need, to meet their needs better. Think really big and think really outside the box. So how much practice do your students get? I know we do a lot of teaching and they do a lot of learning and hearing and listening and, but how much do they actually really practice the skill or the strategy and how much time do they spend applying it is what this is getting at. Because we all know that practice makes permanent. And so the idea is to think about how kids are practicing. Are they practicing in a with guided practice? Are they practicing with partners individually? How are you monitoring that and giving them feedback on their practice? If they're making errors, how are you correcting those? And then checking for moving forward, doing things better and more correctly. And how can you build in more practice? So looking at things like if, if a lesson doesn't go well and you come away at the end of the day just thinking, wow, you know, I, I don't think my whole class got that or I don't even think 80%. If you're, if you're down around 50%, you want to have some sort of a revisit of that concept and not move forward. So how can I build in practice? Can we practice that when we're lining up for lunch? Can we practice it Somehow can I wind that in or weave it into the morning meeting, whether it be in the message, whether it be in the sharing, somehow just be really creative about ways you can think about increasing the amount of time students get to apply the things that you are teaching them. Okay. Okay. For session six, the idea is, what did you do and how did it work? So what exercises did you try? Did you try them individually, small group? What worked and what didn't work? And we're looking for really specific things so we can, we can get a sense that you, you did the exercise and you are truly reflecting so you can grow and change your practice to improve. So the last question is, what would you do differently? If it went perfectly, you are probably like from another planet and you need to go and, I don't know, do something, work with Elon Musk or something. But if you, if you are a teacher, prob probably you would want to make some adjustments after doing an exercise the first time. So this is just an opportunity to reflect on what you did and take away what what really worked. You know, if Susie killed it, great. That's what you want to note on that. And if Billy was, you know, not paying attention, what are you going to do about that? So that's session six. So, and just to build on what Lee said, again, here, what worked and what didn't work is really with the kids. Because everything you try might work with some student. And so really when you're thinking about what worked and what didn't work, what worked and didn't work for these three kiddos. Exactly. So now we're talking <laughs> all about decodable text and this is, this is all about decodable. So you're thinking about, I know that each main selection has several decodable selections that go with it. And you're going to think about how you use those decodable selections, where they are in the lesson, why they are at the beginning of the lesson, how they lend themselves to being able to 
fluently read the main selection because they all tie together and then teach your decodable and then reflect on your lesson. So what changes did you make if you try something new? How did the students respond to that? What was successful and successful for whom? And why do you think that is true? And what would you do differently? So again, you know, it may have worked for some of your students, but we all know giving everybody the same aspirin doesn't have the same effect on everybody. So we thinking individually about their differences, their strengths, their weaknesses, that's, that's the purpose of this. And I, as a first grade teacher, I used my decodable every day and it was not a very, I, we would we would read the decodable several times at the beginning of the week. So on Monday, we would read it where I would read, then they would read. Then the second time, as a whole class, second time through, I would have them read one page silently to themselves. If they had a question, we had a signal so they could signal <laughs> and I would help them with that word. And then they and then we would read it all out loud together, page by page. The third time through, it was hideous because we would start at the beginning of the story and read the story all the way through out loud, everybody standing up so they would project their voices more because they're standing <laughs> up and people walking by in the hall used to stop and look in to make everything, make sure everything was okay in my classroom. But the kids got a lot of practice and they got a lot of good practice reading those decodables. So it doesn't have to be neat and tidy and orderly. It can be slightly chaotic, but chaos with control and chaos with a purpose. So I would think about using those a little bit differently. And again, with a discussion, as you're looking for peers to respond, respond to, skim through and see different ways people are using their decodables, because I think a lot of times we get stuck in the way that, that we do it. Uh, so skim through and see uh, an idea that one of your peers has, and that might inspire you to try how you would try it differently based on what your peers are trying differently. And finally, you will reach session eight. And in session eight, you're going to, again, consider your case study students independently. I know that's a surprise, but what gains have they made? So it's all about data and evaluating your instruction in phonics. So what gains have they made? We may in Canyon School District have a plethora of data to choose from. And it is January and we are in the midst of Acadians testing. So depending what grade level you are teaching, you will have some really awesome tools to evaluate where your kids are in relation to the benchmark and also where they are now in comparison to where they were in August. So we, you can use your benchmarking. If you haven't benchmarked yet and you get to this assignment, you could even use your progress monitoring data because that'll be a really great indication of where your kids are currently. And you can compare that to where they started and look for what they need and use that to, to plan forward in your instruction based on what growth you need, you know they need to still, and skills they need to master. So you can plan your instruction intentionally to close those gaps. And if you need a diagnostic like the PASI or other tools that uh, that you use, use those, diagnose those gaps, and then plan your instruction to close them, because that's really the goal. I'm right? so excited to uh, grade this assignment to see yeah. how everybody's students are doing. Yeah. It's been great to see everybody's growth so far, so I'm really excited for that one. All right, Susan, do you have any questions? Um, no, I just have a comment. Um, okay. I really appreciate this. This gives me, I don't know if you've done them for the other mm -hmm. units. I didn't hear about it or didn't read it or whatever, but wow, now I know what I'm looking for and 
I can hone in on that and just the expectations. Awesome. I work much better when I know my expectations, but this clarification was really awesome. So I appreciate you doing the time. Too. Awesome. And we'll do it for unit four too. So. Okay. If Look you have any questions anytime about anything, don't hesitate to reach out. You can call us, you can text okay. us, you can email us, whatever. We're, we're here all day, every day. Okay. <laughs> Sounds awesome. great. All right. Enjoy no, unit three. So You're okay. welcome. Have a good night. Thanks. Yeah,